Yeah, so this is a project that's been in the you know in the cooker for a long time. I think it's I think it's ready. I'm really excited about this, and so this is why I wanted to speak about this uh, work in particular. It hasn't it hasn't gone through the um, the gauntlet of peer review, so maybe this will be a good opportunity for you to get your knives out. I'm just I'm curious what the what the kind of feedback will be. Uh, so the big picture that I'm interested in is measuring the flow of information between people as they write messages online. A lot of people have studied information flow with lots and lots of different measures and metrics. I think I have a nice spin on it, which I think is actually a very good way to go. Um, and this lets us uh, see about the power of all of the data that's being collected by, for example, a social media provider. So one of the big picture takeaways is trying to understand how much information potentially is available through your social media. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but the amount of data that these companies are generating is, is just enormous, enormous. This is uh, from a, a blog post by Facebook in 2014, and they're probably growing far faster than this. But they're growing, they were at that time growing 600 terabytes a day. Of all the data they collect, I know they receive something like two billion new photographs across all of their uh, properties each day. So it's really just an enormous amount of data. Uh, even things that are not quite at that scale, Twitter, this is Apple's iMessage platform, they're generating uh, enormous amounts of data. 6,000 tweets is about the length of a novel, so it's essentially a new novel is being written every second on Twitter. And Twitter is not by any stretch a very large network compared to some of the things that like Facebook can do. And Apple, they don't get much credit at all, but the iMessage platform sends an enormous amount of data. This is their kind of peak throughput, so this is a quote from one of their uh, uh, senior executives. And yeah, there's a lot of data there, but is it useful? How much of it can you actually you know, feed into some kind of a predictive model? How much of it is just noise? Um, and then connected to that is all the things going on nowadays with misinformation and you know, people kind of cross-talking against one another, not really paying attention, uh, which leads to all sorts of kind of uh, missed opportunities for communication. There's also very strong privacy concerns with all this data that we're essentially giving these companies. And what do these companies know about us even if we don't use the service um, through our social connections. That's another kind of theme that I've been interested in for a long time. And if you're not worried about some of the stuff that Facebook can do, here's very recent news. This is from May. A document was leaked. They think that somebody inside kind of tried to do a whistleblowing, where Facebook had put together a team to try to do research as to how to target emotionally vulnerable youths and then sell that classification to the advertisers so that they, you know, if they want to, um, you know, they, they think their product is going to be more likely to hit that type of person. And, you know, the thing is, you know, there's, there's very strong ethical concerns with this, but if they're successful at these kinds of endeavors, and it seems like they are, that really says something about the power that's being centralized by these kinds of platforms. Okay. So like I was saying, many, many people have studied this in the past. There's a, there's a whole uh, um, thread in computer science side, information diffusion, information transmission. Uh, we've studied it, including uh, myself and other people in Barabasi's group, in mobile phones, how are people kind of spreading information on the social network. And these, these studies, they tend to be kind of what I would call structural, where it's like you're tracking a keyword or a hashtag, and kind of this hashtag is appearing here and then appearing there, and it's moving around the social network. And that is some kind of proxy for the flow of information. Um, or some of them will use a time series. So this is from a paper we did, The Disaster Project, where uh, a bomb went off, and then we tracked the activity of people on their mobile phones in the vicinity of the bombing, and then their first neighbors, their second neighbors, kind of a snowball effect. And you can kind of see this cascade of call activity spread through the network. Um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, you can kind of see this peak moving. And it tells us something that, that I mean, obviously when a bomb goes off, there's a very strong effect on the network. But it lets us quantify the speed of transmission and all sorts of interesting things. Um, let me point out two very interesting papers that take a different tack. They use tools from information theory. Um, this first paper by, I'm going to butcher these names, Versteeg and Galston. Uh, what they do is they, they take those structural measures, they're looking at URLs and tweets, and then they compute the transfer entropy between um, those timings. So you can think of the appearance of URLs as like these spike trains, and then how much information is there in the, um, in the timings of those spike trains across the social network. And they can do things like they can build these kind of networks to infer who's interacting with who. Uh, 
Um, another paper by uh, Borg or Holthofer, I'm terribly sorry if I get the name wrong, is another kind of an interesting approach. So they look at time series in different regions. This is a, a result in, in Spain. And they ask um, this time series of tweet activity, how much information does that give us um, about the, um, the, the time series in different locations? The idea is that um, what, they, what they show, they use a different kind of uh, information the theoretic measure. But what they show is that there are precursors to kind of coordinated global activity. In this case, it was these protests um, that are visible in a sudden change in the information content of these time series. Very, very, very excellent papers. One of the things that uh, distinguishes what I'm going to work on from this kind of stuff is that they don't really look at the content of what people are writing. It's more about the times and the volumes, uh, the, the, the numbers of tweets. And actually, very few papers, I wouldn't say universally no papers, but very few papers apply these information theoretic tools while looking at all of the text that's being generated. And in some sense, the text is the core data that's being created when you're, for example, on Twitter. Uh, so you should be using that. You should be using as much of that information as possible. So that's what we are going to be doing. Uh, so essentially taking each user and, and treating all of their tweets as just this giant string of text to just concatenate all of their tweets together. Uh, and what we're going to ask is uh, a fairly simple quantity, very well understood, called the entropy, specifically the entropy rate, but I'm going to be kind of loose and drop all the rate business. What that tells us is that as we see the text streaming past us, how much information is present in what we have already seen about what we are about to see. So it has this kind of time order, specifically about the next word. So if the time series or the, the text is very, very random, we're not really going to know very much about the next word. But if there's lots of patterns, there's lots of structure, we should have a lot of information. Uh, here's an example from Twitter. Uh, this is an actual account. We didn't study this account in particular. Um, and this account is very regular. There's a very obvious pattern that shows up. And it's completely predictable. We need no extra information to explain the next word. As soon as I see the word makes, I know that the next word is going to be Jack. And that actually holds in this example for every single word. And so the entropy in this case is zero. So the entropy is how many bits you need to encode that next word given passwords. And once you give me this password, I don't need anything else. I know immediately what the next word will be. Uh, so this is what we're going to be studying for our measures of information and information flow, which I'll get to in a little bit. Big question, of course, is how do you compute these kind of entropies? And this is a very long stain. This is, in some sense, the central problem of information theory, which is given the data, what should the entropy? We're using an entropy estimator uh, developed by these people in the 90s. They proved all the asymptotics and everything. The challenge with all of this is that in order to compute the Shannon entropy, um, which is a very simple quantity, you need to know the joint probabilities or the conditional probabilities of all of the words, all the sequences of words. And in order to get that, you need enormous amounts of data, which are not generally available. So these estimators have nice tricks to try to avoid that. Um, this is a very old problem. Shannon confronted this problem in 1951. You know, you can't talk about information theory without showing Shannon. Um, and he had a very clever idea uh, in this paper. It was a beautiful, beautiful paper, just like all of this stuff, where he, he tried to estimate the, the true information content in English, but he didn't really have computers. He didn't really have those joint distributions. So what he did was crowdsource it. He asked people using the kind of mental model that they already have, and he played a kind of game where he would show them a text one character at a time and ask them to guess the next character. And if they are successful at repeatedly making those guesses, that means there's a lot of information already present. He has a very beautiful argument connecting that to the entropy. Very, very genius. Excellent. Uh, so this estimator, which has been used um, in this group, actually. So I learned this from Chow Ming, actually. So this has been bubbling in the back of my head for a very long time. The way this estimator works, it's specifically for text. Uh, is it's this quantity, which if you're familiar with Shannon entropy, looks nothing like the Shannon entropy at all. Um, it's based around what are called match lengths, so these are these lambdas. The idea with this is that um, you, at each point in the string of words, in my case, you kind of say, moving forward, what is the shortest sequence of words from this position that I have not seen in the past? The idea is that if the string is very, very regular, I'm going to have to go very, very far out until I see something new. And uh, it may not be so obvious, although it's all been proved, is that the reciprocal of this quantity, when you average it, is uh, proportional to the entropy. 
So, um, which is a very nice result. There's actually lots of different ways to average it. So it's all about these match lines. If you're familiar with like Lempel Ziv or some of these kind of data compression methods, this match length and the, and the database that you match over, it's all very, very standard. And entropy and information is very closely tied to compressibility. So this is proportional to the entropy rate except for this log end, at least asymptotic. And this tells us again how many bits we need. It's all measured in bits when the log is base two. How many bits do you need to get that next word given past words? Also, lots of fun games you can play where you uh, uh, can take some text and kind of measure their entropy rates. I'm also, I have the perplexity up here. I won't really talk about that. That's kind of a language property. Uh, and I've taken a couple of books that are kind of famous for being uh, a very, very simple writing versus very, very complex writing. I think they've had a fun thing in the middle. And you can see that reflected in these entropies, which I think makes a, makes a lot of sense. And it's a nice kind of sanity check as to what's going on. I wanted to go a step further because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings nut. So I wanted to actually try to study this book, the entropy rate, as you move through the text. So this estimator requires a lot of data. It tends to converge around 10,000 words. And that's what these are, 10,000 word sliding windows throughout the world. Uh, it's got all sorts of peaks and valleys. There's all these sudden changes in the, in the information content in different parts of the text. Uh, and this is totally circumstantial, but it seems like many of those sudden dips uh, tend to correspond to certain events in the book. So they discover the, the ring Bombadil, which was cut out of the movie, if you've only seen the movie, uh, the Balrog. Uh, totally circumstantial, but very interesting. And this is a like a definitely on my bucket list to be able to present a slide that contains the word Balrog, so cross that one off. Uh, I have not read Harry Potter, but I know Harry Potter is enormous. So I did do this. This is just the entropy rate over the entire text. We find something very mysterious with book five, which I've heard is like a very long book and it's the more boring book. It has a very, very low entropy, which means very, very predictable. Uh, I don't really understand what's going on there. I spent a long time trying to see if this was a bug or if I chopped off part of the text or something. It seems to be really solid. I, I don't have a strong explanation. Um, so some, some very interesting stuff. And you would see that if you just look, you don't need the full book to do that, right? You can no, just, yeah. how many pages would you need to kind of establish no. that of grid? I would, again, it's around 10,000 words. I don't know what that works out to be pages, maybe. Well, 70,000 is like a smaller sort of book, so uh -huh. 6,000, 70,000. So like in that case, they're probably like a tenth of the book would be sufficient. Yeah. And you would see the same low entropy across. I haven't looked into that, but that's where, I specifically avoided actually looking at the time series of the books. I have no clue what's going yeah. on. It's loaded this book. For me, uh, okay, so that's books, that's language. A lot of people have been studying these for a long time. I want to get into the social information. So what I'm going to do is essentially take that estimator and apply it to these text streams. So instead of studying a novel, I'm going to study the tweets of people. Uh, and I've kind of visualized the tweet activity with another one of these uh, like kind of spike, uh, spike trains. But each one of these is just the time of the tweet, and we treat all of this as a single text that's been concatenated. Okay, uh, I've gathered a bunch of data. There's a very involved data procedure collection where we, we, a lot of people who work with Twitter work with a random sample. We have at Vermont, we have a 10% random sample. We don't want any missing tweets. We want to get all of the text that they generate, at least the publicly available text. So what we do is we randomly grab people and then we go to the API and we get all of their tweets up to the 3,200 most recent. Uh, we've done some filtering, we've removed bots, we use both computing algorithms and human raters to try to filter out bots. That's not a completely solved problem, but I think we have an okay thing. And part of that, which I'll only touch upon, is that you also can infer the gender to some extent of these, uh, these users on Twitter. We have, altogether, we have about a thousand users, but we're going to expand on that data set. Uh, and when you look at the entropies, you see something like this. This is the distribution overall of the people. Uh, it's a little bit out of context. Most people have between about five and a half to eight bits of information in their tweet streams, but what does this mean? How, how does this compare to other uh, um, sets of data? We need some kind of baseline. Uh, here is if we did not use that estimator, but we just used a traditional Shannon entropy on the kind of on just the words themselves. I mean, all of these are technically Shannon entropies. You can think of this as an uncorrelated or a unigram entropy, where we just say the probability of a word is just the frequency. And it's, it looks very similar. It's kind of shifted a little bit. There's about a three-bit difference. So the, the um, extra information that you get by considering the sequences of words, which you would have to have in, a, in any kind of language analysis, corresponds to about three bits. Is there any correlation? Uh, yeah, there sh so there should be. Um, 
from, from like user to user. Uh -huh. uh, um, I, I have some results about that, um, which I can show later if you want to see. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, okay, a useful baseline is to just compare social media text to regular kind of formally written text, maybe text that's been edited. Uh, so we looked at a corpora, it's a kind of standard natural language uh, data set, and what we find is that the, the, the typical um, position of users, the kind of uh, essential tendency is, is the same, but that people on social media tend to be more broadly distributed. So you, you get more people that are, you know, this could be something like bots, you get people that are much more random, uh, which you wouldn't see in this kind of formal corpora. Form. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that fits with our intuitions about social media. Is bits here like letters? This case, or it will be shorter than letters it's, because it's one letter is multiple bits. Uh, so it's the bits to encode the word. So, um, so I, I did everything on words. So, you think so I should have beginning of six spaces actually in S bang or entropy like that. It's kind of where it saturates. No. Uh, so six bits would be like six characters. Yes, six characters. No, no, it's it's more it's more than that. It, it is about the words. Uh -huh. You can do all of this at the character level, which is you know an alternative idea. What would be your estimate of the length of the, of the entropy right now? Uh, I think a better way to, to think about that, or the way that I would think about that, is the complexity, mm -hmm. which is where you take a, um, you have two to the two to the number of bits, so two to the six. Mm -hmm. That tells you essentially uh, if I was sampling at random, mm -hmm. uh, accounting for all the th stuff that I know, it's equivalent to something that is uh, like a, a randomly sided die with that many sides. So in that case, it would be two to the six characters. Yes. Yeah. Would be the kind of the length. Yeah, that's like the effective vocabulary. Okay. That's why I think that's that's why I presented those perplexities. Um, okay, another uh, uh, very uh, nice way to think about this, which I, I think in some sense is more intuitive. I think that entropy is the more fundamental concept, but something very intuitive is the predictability. So this comes out of something that Fano did. Fano is a very, very famous uh, information theorist that passed away last year. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal work. And Fano's inequality is one of the simplest and like most beautiful ideas in information theory. What, what it does, I'll, I'll skip over a little bit of this for time, but what it lets you do is essentially say, if I had a perfect predictive algorithm to try to guess what the next word is, given the amount of randomness encoded in my estimate of the entropy, how well would that algorithm work? So this thing, this quantity pi is like a bound on the probability that a perfect algorithm will correctly guess the next word. So I'll call that pi. Here's the predictability. Looks almost exactly the same. Um, the, the range is obviously very different. It's going to be between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100. Uh, and it peaks at around 54%. Now, 54% sounds terrible. That sounds like I'm like flipping a coin each time. But you have to remember that this is the probability I correctly guess the next word out of all possible words. And most people have a vocabulary of around 5,000 words. So to be right that often out of 5,000 possibility, possible choices, means that there's actually a lot of them. Which, which makes sense. You would expect that in any kind of uh, non nonsense language. Uh, but this, this is a nice way to kind of quantify and understand some of the effects of these entropies. So a couple of quick results using this. Uh, the first, which I find really interesting, is that famous users on Twitter are significantly more predictable. Uh, so this is, we grab the data set, this is a separate data set, where we've kind of logarithmically stratified our sample based on how many followers the user has. And we see a decrease in the entropy and a corresponding increase in the predictability. It's about 12%, uh, maybe maybe 13%, increase over about four decades. And then it's kind of level off. Something very interesting about this, you don't see it if you just look at the, the uncorrelated entropy. It's, a, it's an effect that's only being brought out from this better estimator. Now, it's a good question as to why that's happening, what makes these accounts different from these accounts. They're obviously probably more invested in using Twitter because they have all these followers. They may be very famous and have a staff that manages all their messages so that kind of enforces more homogeneity. I have a, a less uh, um, nice hypothesis, which is that famous people just tend to talk about themselves more, and so that gives a little bit more predictability, but I don't really know if that's true. Or just the narrow subject range. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like they have one context that they're optimizing. Yes. Yeah. But also, do you say that's what makes you famous? Too. Yes. That's a good engineer yeah. because yeah. you have consistent yeah. people. Don't be yeah, you want to be a beautiful snowflake that's interested in all these different things, but there's really you're just known for this one thing, and if you want to become famous, you should stay on message. So I, I, I think that's also another effect. Now these results are kind of because of all of the data collection, kind of up against the like, the limit of our statistical power, and the effects are not very strong. But we do see some slight differences in gender effects. So the, 
the writing of female Twitter users, at least people that appear to be female, tends to have a lower entropy rate, which means it's a little bit more predictable. Again, the effect is very small. I don't have a very strong uh, uh, explanation for this. Um, one thing is that um, girls are known to do better on standardized tests than boys in high school in English, in writing. So it could be something to do with that. Uh, another thing is that Twitter is a known kind of dumpster fire for harassment, and it has all sorts of problems there, and so it could be that some effects of harassment are causing female Twitter users to change a little bit how they write their tweets. I really don't know, and again, the effect is so small. I mean, it is statistically significant, but it's so small, I wouldn't put a whole lot of weight into this. Um, into this thing. Okay, so all of that is about information. It's not about information flow, which was in the title. So how do we do uh, with that? I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit slow. I'll try to, I'll try to pick up. Um, so what we've asked so far is how much information is there in, in the past about your future? Now we're going to twist that game a little bit to do this. We're going to take a pair of individuals, the ego and the altar, and we're going to ask how much information is there about the future of the altar in the past of the ego? Uh, this is called a cross entropy. The cross entropy is essentially saying uh, if I try to encode a text stream but I use the wrong probability distribution, how many bits will I need? And the difference between those two is called the KL divergence or relative entropy. And I don't think this has been studied for the social information flow. And I'm going to plant a flag and say that this is a very natural way, either this or the KL divergence. This is a very natural way to measure this. If I can predict your future given my past, then there is a flow of information from me to you. Okay. Uh, and here is the estimator that we've generalized. Uh, th the idea is to essentially compute the match lengths over this other database instead of the uh, um, Ego's database. Uh, this is a new estimator, but a very, very similar estimator was uh, studied a long time ago by Ziv and Merhav. Ziv from Lempel Ziv, so very, very famous uh, work. Okay. Now here what we've done is we've taken our data set and we've expanded it to include the, the alters, at this point just one alter, uh, the alters of those uh, egos that we were studying before. So the blue distribution is what we saw before, and this orange distribution is if we look at that cross entropy. So we lose information uh, because you would expect someone else to be less predictive than yourself, but sometimes you still actually have a reasonable amount of information. There's a, a very broad spread of these people, provide very little information. These people provide a lot of information. Remember, these entropies are how much extra information you need. So the more you need, the less you have. Uh, and this is all focused on, on what we call the right one alter, which is the person you contact most frequently, so it is your best tie. Because, of course, there's going to be a broad spread of close ties and far ties. Uh, very useful kind of toy model, which I'll skip just for time, but this is a very fun little thing. Um, we essentially uh, uh, have two people, two kind of synthetic people that are randomly tweeting at one another, but every so often the ego copies what the alter is saying instead of generating their own uh, little bits of text. The idea is that they're kind of quoting subclauses or they're having a conversation with some more of that. And we can actually work out analytically what, uh, the, what those cross entropies would be. You can't really see it, but there's the theoretical prediction which is very, very close. Uh, for other parameters in the model, it's not, it's not quite as close, it's a little bit harder to simulate. Uh, it's a very simple toy model, but it actually seems to describe things very well. There's also an interesting thing which I can talk about later if you want, that this other curve goes up. So that is if I try to, if I keep copying you, uh, I'm gaining information from you, but the other way around, you would not expect there to be much information. The first user is just kind of randomly generating words. Uh, we actually see an increase in trends. So you actually lose information uh, as the other person copies you more. It's, it's uh, not explaining it very well because uh, you have a lot of reciprocating access going on. It doesn't, doesn't matter too much. I'm just trying to say that. Okay, the last thing, and what I think is most important, is to extend this from a single alter to your set of alters. We don't have access to all of the alters, but we can try with as much as we can. And this is kind of a wild west of information theory because we have many variables interacting. It's not nearly as well understood as if you have one or two variables. <coughs> But what we're going to try to do is estimate the kind of cumulative information across all of the alters. And we're going to rank the alters by the contact level so that the first one is your number one, your number two, and so on and so on. Uh, um, and let me see if this, if this movie plays. This is as you add more alters. Um, maybe you can play them. So I start with just your best friend, then it's your top two friends, your top three friends. 
And what you can see is that as you add more friends, those cross entropies kind of creep downward and they start to resemble the, the kind of self entropy. That's not really the right term for it. So you can see that gain of information. Here is the same quantity, the, the average as you add more. So you can see that you're gaining information as you add more people. Now, of course, that would have to happen. There is more text that I'm searching over, so I would expect there would be more matches. So we need to better understand that, so we've introduced some controls. We have two controls here. One is a social control, where people are giving random answers. Uh, how much information does essentially a random person on Twitter give about you? And then we have a temporal control. Twitter is very much like news focused, and things are happening in the moment. So what we do is we take your actual alter, we look at all the times when that alter tweeted, and we find other tweets that occurred at about that same time and build a kind of synthetic alter out of those, controlling for and what we see is that there's a little bit of this decreasing trend, but not much. So again, as you get more text, you would expect there to be a little bit more information. Not very much. And you never get anywhere near the actual information of your friends. So it seems like there is some evidence that people are actually listening to one another on Twitter, or at least they're talking about the same things. Uh, and let me just emphasize that this is all real tweets. It's just they're assembled in different ways. So I'm not like randomizing the words or anything like that. So How about the retweets? Uh, are the retweets in? Because so that's, well, yeah, that's a good point. I, I went a little bit fast. I intentionally excluded all retweets from the tweet streams. Mm -hmm. uh, we kept hashtags and at mentions and all these things, but we took out retweets because that might artificially inflate things. So um, here it is for predictability. So we can see that we go from a little bit below uh, forty percent to up to about here, and something very interesting happens here which is that you actually get more information out of your alters than out of yourself if you have enough alters. So you go a little bit above. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. That means in principle, if you had all the friends, they would do a little bit better than if you had yourself. So, so what's going on there? And that, that brings us to kind of like the, the uh, best, most strict control, which is if this information in your friends is useful, it should give you something beyond what you would have about yourself. So we do one more control, which is we essentially, it's not even really a control, which is we take all the alters and we then include the past of the ego. So if we had 15 alters, we're now searching over 16 things. Uh, and here we see that there is this trend. You always gain a little bit, uh, which means there is some information in those alters beyond what the ego provides him or herself. Not very much, uh, uh, but it's very, very significant. And it, it stays above that which you get from the alters, which I, I think makes sense. Okay, uh, another thing that we can do with this, we only have that many alters. It's very, very slow to get all of this data. Uh, it's about 500 gigs of data, um, but it's the, the, the limiting factor is querying Twitter. What we can do is fit extrapolating functions to these curves and see what they saturate. So if I had an unlimited number of friends, or maybe something like a Dunbar's number of friends, what would be the predictability that we would achieve? Uh, and here it is in bits, and here it is in, um, in this predictability level. So you get about 60% predictability for your alters, again, if you had an infinite number. Um, if you didn't have an infinite number, but you know a fairly large number, you're very, very close. So it's essentially already saturated. So that's kind of what we would claim somewhat boldly is a kind of fundamental level of information for predictive potential. Uh, and if you do this on this kind of uh, tr transfer entry, we didn't really talk about this, where you include the ego as well, it bumps up by about 4% maybe 3%. So you get this additional um, little bump due to uh, uh, adding your social network onto yourself. Uh, another way to think about this, which I think is a, a very useful take home, is that uh, a social media platform that has all of your friends but does not have you has approximately 95% of the predicted accuracy that it would have if you were also on board. So if you quit Facebook, in some sense it might not matter. Facebook can still track everything as long as Facebook has all of your friends. Another way to think of this is a, a rising social network violates all privacy. You know, like a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, okay, I'm really out of time, but um, we have some interesting results on reciprocity that fit very well with the model. So this is um, uh, if the ego talks to the altar a lot or the altar talks to the ego a lot, do you get more or less inflammation? And it, it very much fits our intuition, so it's kind of uh, validates this flow of information. Also a notion of attention span. So if we take the recent past and exclude it, how much information do we lose? So this is if we exclude five hours up to about 24 hours, how much worse do we get? And there is a loss in information, but it's actually pretty mild. So it means there's a lot of information in the farther past. Um, 
uh, especially about the ego, there tends to be less for the alters. Um, and after, it's mostly saturated after about three hours. So most of what you're going to lose happens in that time. Um, also, very briefly, we did we discussed gender. You can also look at gender between um, in, between pairs. So how much information flows between uh, dyads of the same gender versus mixed gender? And there's some some evidence here. This is really on the far side of the statistics, so it's significant, but I wouldn't read too much into it. There's some evidence that there is uh, more information flow on the same gender dyads and less information flow on the mixed gender dyads. Uh, but the effects are not very strong. Uh, okay, so um, as a summary, the whole, the whole point of all this is I wanted to understand information flow. We looked at Twitter. I wanted to look at the text, the actual words, the language. That's the coin of the realm. That's what people are really doing. Um, and we did this with this estimator. This estimator has a very nice advantage that it also naturally incorporates the time ordering because when we search the past of the altar, we look at the time in which we're searching, not just the positions in the text. I think that's the key advantage to this method over other methods. We found that there was significant information, like I was saying before, up to 95% of the potential predictive accuracy if you start doing kind of machine learning on people. It may be available to these platform providers even if you don't use the platform, due to the flow of information. I think, I think this last thing, that your friends are giving away your data, is something that many people haven't thought about. Okay, another thing um, as a kind of discussion point is all of this, all of these measures, it's about the next word. And is that really the most meaningful thing to be trying to predict? Uh, it's meant to be a kind of proxy quantifying this information flow. It's not necessarily useful. It is useful <coughs> in this kind of context. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that um, the, the mobile phones, when you're doing this typing, I think they use simpler methods in this kind of information theory. And I think for most people, it, it works very well. It's kind of a solved problem. But what I really want to get at is things like social entailment, where if I say something, it causes someone else to say something else. And how can we measure that? That's you know much farther down the road. Another idea is the words are, in some sense, the conduit for the message or the concepts that are being discussed. If you could infer some conceptual level, and this is something that is a big, big project in computational linguistics, if you can understand the concepts that people are discussing, and then maybe ask about, um, how to predict, you know, what is the concept of this discussion and how do those things change, then you're starting to get at really the core of the information that's spread. Okay, let me thank my collaborators. Uh, Lewis Mitchell, who's in Australia now, this is one reason why this project has taken so long, is we're like 11 and a half hours out of sync with one another. Uh, and also my master's student, Sipe, who just graduated um, this, this spring, she helped with some of this as well. And uh, this was supported by uh, an NSF. So thank you very much. So we're a little bit out of time. The tradition in this lab is 30 minutes talk, so I'm going to keep maybe two short questions. And then after that, you can talk to me yeah, as sorry. much as you want, OK? So any machine? Yeah, OK, hand. just two comments, one short comment. This predicting new words. Um, so I'm using WhatsApp in four languages regularly. And in three of them it works, including English, but in Hungarian it doesn't tend to work at all because it's flipped around. Some the, of the language is agglutinating. So I think this uh, jump to concept would would maybe increase. Yeah, we only looked at English because we knew about these effects. Also, yeah. I think Japanese has a kind yeah. of things tend to be backwards. So that's just one comment. So. And the other one, could you calculate something like the like a horizon of impact by looking? Not just at altars, but at the altars of altars, the altars of altars yeah. of altars, and then see how fast you converge to that social control. Yeah, I would, I would like to get more into the network. We've only really studied these yeah. ego networks because it's, it's just very slow to collect that data. You know, we have all these rate limiting and all these yeah. kinds of things. Because, because we can't just use the random sample. We want to get all of their activities so there are no gaps. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's, that's something we would like to Uh, real nice talk. So Thank I wonder you. something. So on Twitter, it's more like how you react. So the predictability that you get is, given the context, how you react. Is it like something interesting to me or not? But if you look at like the, like you did for the Lord of the Rings, the ones that are harder to predict, are those tweets give more personally ex uh, information, like experiential type of tweets, or do they more about like the what's happening in the world? So did you try to distinguish these? Two? So the Lord of the Rings is a little that's a little bit circumstantial. You know, I had all of the spikes, and actually, I have another. Uh, um, here, 
yeah, I have another kind of view of this. Um, those drops tend to happen in like the action sequences, so when they're running through with all the swords. and So I have some intuition that like when you're running and chopping and fighting, that you use simpler words, you use a reduced vocabulary. Um, but I don't, I don't have much evidence for that. And really, you know, if you want to take a pessimistic view of this, like there's events happening throughout the book, and I only highlighted like the ones that kind of happen to fall near those spikes, and if the spikes uh, or the, the dips kind of fell somewhere else, they would line up with other events. Uh, so I, I don't really have a real strong argument why this is happening in other parts of the text, uh, but it is something that's, that's worth more systematic. This kind of things I think uh, studied in stylometry, where when there are like actions going on, the sentences get shorter. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So yeah, maybe so that has to do with that. That might exactly connect in. Yeah, if you have any references, yeah, yeah. That, sure. So two things. One of them is that uh, Jim will be here for the full week, right? So yeah. there will be lots of chances to chat with him. And second, feel free to kind of ask him further questions. Those of you who couldn't get your answer, question answers. And let's finally, let's thank you for coming to me. Thank you.